Guys, before we start this week's episode, we need to share an exciting announcement with our beloved matter of opinion cultists, followers. Sorry, the card says moops. Carlos has gotten us into moops. That's a Seinfeld. Of course it's Seinfeld. It's, it's the Bubble Boy episode. No, I know. I know what it is. Ross. I'm questioning the wisdom of starting off a discussion that's fully about 21st century podcasting realities with a Seinfeld reference. That's all. Well, do you have a better suggestion? I think Muscovites is what our no, we our will people not go, are called. No, no Muscovites. Muscovites. Ross, no. you want to call them the movies? No, I don't. All right. Well, Moops, Muscovites, we are excited to tell you that Matter of Opinion is entering its subscription era. Starting next week, we will begin offering subscribers exclusive content on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's a brand new way for you to access some special conversations just for you, our beloved Moops. Muscovites. But that's right. As a subscriber, you'll get access to our full back catalog of episodes, all the greatest hits, and also our secret bonus content for the conversations that they won't let us have on the main feed, which are mostly just me talking to myself about Catholic Empire in North America. I want you to go undercover inside Area 51. That's what I'm here for, Ross. I mean, who's to say I'm not speaking to you from the Nevada desert right now? <laughs> All right. Well, dear listeners, do not worry. Our latest episodes will still be free. Free. Gratis. No charge. Free. But if you want to get this snazzy subscriber exclusive content and our archives next week, all you have to do is link your New York Times account to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And if for some unfathomable reason you don't already have a New York Times subscription, do not fear. You can go to nytimes.com slash podcasts and get one. But what, you may ask, if I'm an audio purist, I don't care about all the other stuff that a full Times subscription offers. Carlos, my friend, I am so glad to have the answer to this. <laughs> the Times has created an audio-only subscription for just six bucks a month. You can get access to every New York Times podcast and their back archives. And you're letting the New York Times know that podcasts like ours are worth supporting. Please do that. And ours especially. So, okay, if you're already a subscriber, all you have to do is plug in your Times login to Apple Podcasts and Spotify starting next week. And if you aren't yet, you just head over to nytimes.com slash podcasts or hit the link in our show notes to get yourself a Times subscription or a Times audio subscription and get access to the Muscovites Clubhouse. Moops, moops. Please, someone out there, send us a better suggestion so I can get these two to stop. Vladimir Putin has cut me a large check, and we're going with Muscovite. For the love of God. You know what? I think you all may be convincing me to finally subscribe to the New York Times. Oh, my God. (laughs) Carlos. From New York Times Opinion, I'm Carlos Lozada. I'm Michelle Cottle. And I'm Ross Douthat. And this is Matter of Opinion, where, in the spirit of J.D. Vance and Tim Walls, we're really not that far apart on the issues here. We're just some well-meaning, folksy types trying to find common ground. Just a few people from the heartland of America having a civil debate about tax policy. Uh Uh-huh. So... This week, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance and Minnesota Governor Tim Walz faced off in the VP debate. And folks seemed really struck by how civil and substantive the debate seemed. Those were the, the popular words in some of the coverage. Now, that may be true, or it may just be that whenever Trump isn't on the stage, everything suddenly looks like the Lincoln-Douglas debates. But regardless, I want us to get substantive on what Walls and Vance accomplished with all that alleged substance and civility they gave us Tuesday night. And we'll also get into what the two candidates are bringing to their tickets and what they might mean, if anything, for the future of their parties. Sound like a plan? I was told there would be no fact checking, but (laughs) there is. You know I'm here, Ross. I'm ready. (laughs) Well, Ross, you are going to start. Tell us who you think won this debate. I uh, believe that James David Vance won the debate um, handily. I think it was the best performance in a national debate by a Republican politician 
in the last 20 years. I think it eclipsed Mitt Romney's performance against Barack Mm. Obama in 2012. It's a low bar, I want to be clear. Uh, Republican candidates for president and vice president have not generally distinguished themselves as practiced, successful debaters. But I think Vance was very strong and very strong in ways that I think were particularly effective. Before the debate, I had written that he needed a little more Ronald Reagan in his pitch, a little less sort of dark evening in America kind of rhetoric, a little more sort of the future is bright, America's going to be great again kind of stuff. I actually think he, the politician he tried to channel more was Bill Clinton with a certain degree of personal biography, meeting, you know, I understand where folks are coming from. But yeah, I just think it was a very strong performance overall and one that, you know, was particularly strong given that when you are the running mate of Donald Trump, you are (laughs) stuck trying to make Donald Trump sound like a reasonable person. And to the extent that that can be done, and we can talk about whether it can be done at all, I think Vance succeeded. Michelle, how about you? I totally agree with Ross that he was the much more polished debater. What we saw in the debate was the J.D. Vance that had made much of the political class fall in love with him, including a lot of more progressive folks. Walls was a much more kind of anxious, flustered debater. I think uh, somebody online said it was like watching your most nervous uncle debate your smuggest cousin over Thanksgiving dinner. (laughs) Um, And And finally, the liberals are the uncles. There you go. How the wheel turns, Michelle. Now, they did not say crazy, unhinged, drunken uncle. He had the heavier lift because he is what people are looking to for kind of what will be the future of his party. Now, they didn't yell at each other, and it was much more civil. But Vance in particular, as Ross was alluding to, had the job of sane-washing Trump. And he does that extremely well. I mean, to to paraphrase the old saying, you know, that, that boy knows how to polish a poop. And that's what he was left doing for much of this debate. And by God, he is extremely talented at that. Is, is polish a poop a saying? No, but polish a turd is, as actually ah. do not Michelle, want to Michelle have Michelle was that. sane washing the folksy okay. rhetoric of her down home upbringing. I am making it more family I friendly, see. Carlos. Okay, okay. No, no, I just, I just need to know these things. But Carlos, Carlos, all right. So what did you think? No, I mean, actually, I'm interested in your Romney comparison, Ross. I agree with you on that. One of the reasons Romney won that debate is because he was able to upend the image that Democrats have been painting of him for months as this like silver spoon, aloof, heartless management consultant who's going to let venture capitalists like steal your job, right? And he instead appeared as sort of this empathetic, well-meaning, earnest, you know, super prepared guy who's going to like do battle for the American people. And I think Vance accomplished a similar turn in the sense that he ran counter to the, you know, the weird image, the freaky, you know, podcast guy talking about cat ladies that Democrats have emphasized. Now, I have no idea which is the real J.D. Vance. I do agree that he won this debate. If you'd been hiding under a rock all this time and this debate was all you knew of J.D. Vance, you'd think he's a thoughtful guy, willing to stake out common ground, even show spontaneous empathy from time to time. Yes, obsessed with immigrants. Yes, embarrassingly unwilling to speak the truth about 2020. Those are not unusual positions in his party, right? He needed to make Trump sound reasonable, as you say, you know, and he called it just common sense wisdom. That's what Trump is, common sense wisdom. And he had to make himself seem more presidential, especially because Trump is 78, right? I think he accomplished both those things. And as for Walls, I mean, there's a reason we talk about debates as a performance. So much is about how they sound and they look. Tim Walls looked nervous, especially early on. He got better as he went along. His best moments were in abortion and healthcare. January 6th, when he point blank asked Vance who won the election and Vance couldn't answer or declined to answer. But it basically felt like Vance proactively helped himself in the debate, whereas Walls, I think, succeeded to the extent that he did no harm. Now, I know the snap polls say something different, right? They say this thing was a tie or close to a tie. Walls' favorables went up even more than Vance's. But that's how I felt just watching the debate. Well, I I would say about those snap polls, I am not a fan of Tim Walls based on the Tim Walls that we have seen 
doing, you know, sort of big set piece speeches and cable news hits. You know, he's got the persona of a Midwestern coach, but the politics of, you know, Bernie Sanders or something, that leaves me completely cold. It feels like this bizarre performance of this sort of liberal fantasy of Midwestern masculinity. I don't know. I'm not into it. I liked Waltz better on the debate stage than I've liked him in those sort of more performative environments. The fact that he lost the debate did not make me suddenly dislike him. I thought he came across as a well-meaning machine politician from a Midwestern state. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not surprised that there is a gap between what we in the punditocracy consider a debate win and what America considers a debate performance. Look, we like people who can get up there, make their case, sound good, look slick, very articulate, hyper-articulate even, and that's not what America is necessarily looking for. It's like when George W. Bush and Al Gore were in the spotlight in 2000. Everybody talked about how Gore was smarter and more policy savvy and smoother. And George W. Bush was by far more likable. So you just never know how these things are going to get read. Right. And well, and I also think Vance coming in was an extremely unpopular figure, not just with liberals, but with a set of people who have sort of loosely held political opinions. For a certain kind of voter, everything they knew about him was a bunch of podcast clips. And God knows, you know, if everything anyone knew about us was a bunch of podcast clips and then we were put on the national stage. We would be elected president immediately. Yes, of course. A triumvirate. I'd have to sane wash you, Ross. (laughs) I get to be Octavian, but, you know. All right. All right. Let's move from the performance to the substance of this substantive debate. Um. I'm wondering if we can compare Vance and Walls to their running mates. Where do you think they make better or worse cases for the policies and positions that the top of the tickets are um, pushing for? Well, look, Vance got into some of the touchy issues like abortion and immigration and put a very kind of gentle, friendly gloss on it, even as he tap danced around a lot of the things that worry people not in his party. Like, he did not want to discuss those mass deportations that have been promised. He did not want to talk about the abortion restrictions that he has long favored. He wanted to talk instead about how women need to be given options, how you need to take care of new mothers and babies, which is great, but is in no way We've seen no sign from this Republican Party that that sort of thing is of any interest. So even where he laid out some ideas that were gentle, if you looked at what has happened, they were utter horseshit. Uh, Well, no, that's not true. In fact, that's absurd. It's not absurd. Because Vance is, in fact, the vice presidential nominee of the Republican Party and gets a pretty strong say in what the Republican Party actually stands for. And his running mate, Trump has gone even further than Vance in terms of staking out, you know, there's got to be exceptions on abortion. We're, you know, we're leaving it to the states. We're not doing a national ban. So I think most Republican politicians, unfortunately, are very happy to run away from the abortion issue. Well, right now they are because they're worried that they're going to get their clock cleaned in November. I'm willing to stipulate that J.D. Vance would love to have a kinder, gentler approach to the women who are not allowed to have abortions. Okay. But as you know, the vice president except cannot for, unilaterally for, do that. I'll accept the stipulations and make a different argument, which is that I think in Vance's very strong performance, the weakest point by far, obviously, is any question related to January 6th and the 2020 election. And the strongest part by far is that he was able to do what Trump sort of was unable to do in the debate with Harris, which is just make a straightforward argument that you should elect Donald Trump because the world was more stable when Trump was president, the border was more secure, and the economy was better. That argument is why Trump is competitive in this election in spite of all his faults, and Vance made it better than Trump makes it. And I think Walsh doesn't really have a strong comeback to that argument. And that was part of the dynamic of the debate. So 
Ross, you mentioned the border. In the debate, Vance comes off as far less unhinged than than Trump on those issues. He says we should deport anyone who's committed a crime first. Then he says the problem with immigration is they drive up housing costs. You know, it's like a super policy wonky approach to immigration. But on that particular front, he cites a Federal Reserve study. So I I looked up that Federal Reserve study yesterday. First, it's not a study. I I must confess, I I worked in the Federal Reserve in a prior life. This was not a Fed study. It was a brief speech by a member of the Board of Governors. It was basically a New York Times column, right? And is there something wrong with citing something that's the length of a New York Times column, Carlos? What are you, what are you trying to say? And and so Vance cites this speech as alleged support for the notion that immigrants are driving up housing costs. Here's what the member of the board, what she actually said. There is a risk that strong consumer demand for services, increased immigration, and continued labor market tightness could lead to persistently high core services inflation. Given the current low inventory of affordable housing, the inflow of new immigrants to some geographic areas could result in upward pressure on rents, as additional housing supply may take time to materialize. So she's not saying that this is happening. She's saying it could happen. She's talking about risks to the inflation outlook. She says the presence of immigrants is one potential factor. She doesn't say the answer is to kick them out. She says the problem is the low inventory of affordable housing. And what Vance doesn't tell you is that earlier in that same speech, she says one of the reasons for reduced inflation is, wait for it, increases in the number of available workers due in part to immigration. So Vance sounds really good in the context of a 90-minute debate. When you dig into what he's saying, he's a lot less persuasive. The study he cites says immigration has helped bring down inflation not raise it. Yes. Was that a simplification of a more detailed and nuanced policy argument? Yes. Was it a more sort of detail-based commentary than anything that Tim Walsh said in the course of the debate? Tim Walsh in the course of the debate said things like, you know, what are you talking about? You know, opening federal lands to housing when that is, in fact, part of his own running mate's policy. But here you are picking and picking at J.D. Vance for, you know, only citing okay. part of the argument in Federal Reserve Two paper. Things. That's nonsense. Also, obviously, <laughs> immigration has an effect on the price of housing. This is like the central issue in Canadian politics right now. Can you solve that by building tons and tons of new housing? Theoretically, of course. Of course you can. Russ, you, you keep saying things are absurd or nonsense. All I'm saying is that the the brief remarks that, um, that's what it's called, brief remarks, that J.D. Vance is citing, Ross, that the very thing he's citing says immigration has helped reduce inflation. In inflation in housing prices? Inflation overall. Inflation in other areas, but not inflation in housing prices, which is what he's talking about. Okay, so so Ross is feeling Ross is feeling persecuted. I'm here. not feeling I'm not feeling persecuted. I'm feeling goaded. Two I'm things. Feeling goaded one into no, Ross. If if facts trigger you, oh. then you know. <laughs> oh oh I'm oh I'm sorry. Why didn't you just turn off my microphone, Carlos? Maybe that would that's be a good not idea. that's not the issue. So wait a second. So I think what we're looking at here is just a broader point that Vance had a very heavy lift on sane washing, but the fact that he is a very good debater does not make what he's saying over all the truth. For instance, when they were talking about Republican attempts to repeal Obamacare, Vance talked about how Trump is actually the man we should thank for saving the ACA. Now, if you want to talk about some serious through-the-looking-glass nonsense, the only reason there is an ACA is because of John McCain. Stepping up, when the Republicans were on the verge of not repealing and replacing, but just repealing, McCain blocked it into the Senate. But Vance was insisting that concepts of a plan, as Trump put it, was actually a very smart, very clever way to explain what was going on. Trump had four years to give us his concepts of a plan while he was president, and he couldn't do it. He had a Republican Congress teed up to do this, both houses in his control. Okay, this is, but I, I'm going to not be goaded. I'm just going to be very calm <laughs> and say, I think this is a good example of if you want to make sort of an optimist's case for what having someone like Vance as vice president represents, because two different things happened in the Trump administration with Obamacare. First, there was the push to repeal it without having a clear plan. Yes, I agree. 
However, the Trump administration continued and made a bunch of regulatory shifts around Obamacare that were, you know, debatable, but I think arguably quite constructive and actually made Obamacare more stable and work better. That is also part of the Trump administration record on healthcare policy. So essentially what Vance was doing was saying, I'm going to take the second half of my running mate's record and say, that's what we represent for the next four years. Now, is there a certain degree of politicians bullshit involved in wiping away the first half? Of course there is. Absolutely. I agree with you guys. But politics is also about saying, you know, I'm taking this piece of our agenda and emphasizing it and making it our agenda for the second term. He wasn't he wasn't explaining the plan for the second term. He was rewriting the history of the first one. Very much like, oh, why would you worry about a government overthrow when Trump handed off? I mean, he was outraged that anybody had suggested that Trump wouldn't hand off power peacefully because he did on January the 20th. He's wiping out the January 6 events and everything from then. These are totally different things. One is the worst thing that Trump did that Vance is stuck defending, and that's you you will get no defense of that defense from me. So let's, let's move to Tim Walls. Tim Walls is the guy who got himself on the ticket in part over his willingness to call Trump and Vance weird, right? That was the the sort of Tim Walls meme. And what was interesting to me is that in this debate, he didn't go in that direction. Normally In the VP debates, you have the sort of red meat attack dog vibe versus the presidential debates, which is supposed to be more elevated. The Trump era has scrambled that distinction, right? And and in fact, flipped it on its head. Now it was the vice presidential debate that was seen as a more civil exchange of ideas, unlike perhaps this podcast so far, but whatever. (laughs) Walls got himself on the ticket by branding Trump and Vance as weird. And he seemed to pull back on those kind of critiques in this debate. Now, was the weird thing a performance or a strategy? If so, did did this kind of civil approach to the debate help or hurt the Harris-Walls campaign? I think the calculation, presumably, by Walls, was that, one, there's sort of diminishing returns to some of those lines of attack— that in the end, the election is more likely to be about the economy and foreign policy and immigration and Donald Trump's record in January 6th than it is to be about sort of the weirdness of the Republican ticket. But also, I think for both candidates, you could see a presumption that their job was to go after the top of the ticket, not each other. And so for Waltz, that meant he didn't bring up podcasts and cat ladies and anything like that. And Vance, for his part, made no attempt to, for instance, litigate Waltz's record in Minnesota. Or his military record. Or his prevarication about when he was in China for Tiananmen Square, which the moderators brought up. Vance didn't go after that. So I think both candidates had a, you know, let's be nice to each other and try and ding Trump and Harris strategy. And I think on behalf of exhausted Americans, people appreciated that. We've got enough crazy at the top of the ticket that I think both of them had a very specific job. Vance needed to not look mean and cold and unhinged in order to kind of rebrand himself from the clips and what the Democrats have been pushing his image as. And Walls has a reputation as being a good guy, politicking on the, and I hate this term so much, the politics of joy. I'm sorry, that is a Christmas carol. That is not a presidential (laughs) position, but that's what he's there with. So he needed to look civilized and genial as well. So they both had their reasons. And I think, you know, I think it was a welcome break from what we are accustomed to. I do think that the civility thing was far more useful for Vance than for Walls, in part because I think it's something that merely reaffirmed Walls whereas it was something that helped rehabilitate Vance. Yeah, I think Wallace's strongest moment was the January 6th question, obviously, where he was, what he did effectively in that moment was be confrontational with Vance in a way that was about Trump, right? And that he, I think he definitely needed to do 
more of that. I think he was stuck in a position where he had a long list of like things that are bad about Trump that he would sort of bring up, like Trump did this, Trump did that, and so on. But what he actually needed was a version of, you know, what is being offered by you, my interlocutors in this podcast, basically a sort of general like, that sounds great, J.D., but isn't Trump indefensible? Like he should have just sort of said that over and over in different ways. All right, we'll take a quick break here. And when we come back, let's talk about whether or not these Veeps represent the future of their parties. Was there anything in this debate, guys, that you think either reaffirmed why Trump picked Vance or why Harris picked Walls or that would make either of them feel any kind of buyer's remorse? I think one of the key questions going into this debate was in a world where Trump loses this election, what happens to J.D. Vance? Is he seen as, you know, the weirdo populist who who was a big mistake for Trump to pick? That was a big narrative going into the debate. That's not a narrative anymore. J.D. Vance, he may not be the Republican nominee in 2028, but there are a lot of Republicans who are very happy, very, very happy (laughs) with him right now. I think Vance completely vindicated himself in the eyes, certainly of the political chattering class and I assume Trump. I mean, there was even some talk about whether Trump would be irritated that Vance got such great reviews after Trump tanked his debate. So when you're looking at that, that that suggests that you have broken through with a chattering class that was wondering if you were the wrong pick. Yeah, that was sort of the anti-Trump cope from the evening was like, oh, maybe Vance did so well that Trump will get mad and debate again or something, which of course not. I don't think is what's going to happen. But it's hard to say watching the debate that Harris made the strongest possible choice here. And Walsh, he neither embodied a plausible future for his party, seemingly, nor did he give the impression of being like a gravitas lending figure, a seasoned elder statesman. And those are sort of the two models for a good vice presidential pick. Either they're bringing something big and new to the table, or they're really going to be trustworthy in the situation room. I don't think Walsh offered either. And I don't think it's a great signal that Harris picked him. I think the people who wanted her to pick Josh Shapiro had a good night. Well, you know, kind of the chatter was that one of the ways that Walls endeared himself and got himself on the ticket was that in the interviews, he made clear that he was going to just take one for the team and do whatever she needed, whereas other potentials, including Shapiro, were more like, well, what would this be like? What would my role be? They were more interested in kind of like how they would have an influence, whereas Walls was just like, I'm here for you. Yes, but I think you can see the limits of that as as a selling point. Oh, of course. I think if Kamala Harris and Tim Walls lose Pennsylvania, that'll be the sort of proof is in the pudding moment about what she could have gotten if she'd picked a popular Pennsylvania governor as her running mate. But you guys have brought up the role that Vance and Walls could or could not potentially play in the future of their parties. So what do Vance and Walls signal to each of you, if anything, about the future of their parties. Vance is being talked about as the future of Trumpism. He was picked by Trump as his standard bearer going forward, you know, assuming we have more elections after this. Uh, Walls, I think, means a lot less. I think the Democratic Party is very concerned about uh, its losing touch with rural voters and middle America. And I think Walls's persona, they thought, would be good to try and correct some of that, but I don't see him myself as like the logical next step for the party. Yeah, I I think whether Kamala Harris is elected president or not, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about what does the Democratic Party want over the next 10 or 15 years? 
And I think the Walsh pick after this debate also feels like sort of an evasion. So there's some kind of future big argument about what the Democratic Party stands for that the harris Walls ticket is maybe sleepwalking towards, but it's not made manifest yet at all. I agree with that. I, I think it's, <laughs> it's one thing to say that Tim Walls doesn't represent the future of the Democratic Party. It's not even clear that Kamala Harris represents the future of the Democratic Party in a significant way. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be like J.D. Vance here and try to you know, make a positive out of a negative. But I mean, I think in some respects, it speaks to the health of a party that there are still a lot of competing holds a lot of competing voices, lots of different views that are still sort of duking it out in the Democratic Party, and that you would see come to the fore immediately in the event of Harris and Walls losing, and maybe even if they win. On the Republican side, the party has been so fully overpowered by Donald Trump at all levels that it's hard to know where else it could go. I saw the debate this week between Vance and Walls as less the last debate of the 2024 cycle, and more the first debate of J.D. Vance's 2028 presidential campaign. Yeah, I think one of the things you're pointing to, Carlos, is that the the Democratic Party is still going through the crisis of how far it's going to move toward the left. And there was a period of time where the progressive left was seen as ascendant and the center of energy of the party had moved in that direction. And then I think with some races in 2022, there was a sense that it had overstepped. And you see with House races, with Senate races, that kind of a more of a pivot back to the center. And so this is still going on, whereas, as you note, the Republican Party has basically been subsumed with, you know, into Trumpism. And even those who tried, like Ron DeSantis, to take Trumpism and morph it into something slightly less unhinged made no progress. So that's going to be the situation until Trump is no longer on the scene, and then we'll kind of see where it goes. Well, let's leave it there on that moderate reinterpretation. We've, we've become just gradually more civil and moderate as the discussion has gone on. Let's take a break. When we come back, we will get hot or cold. All right, we're back. We're back. It is time for Hot Cold. Who's got it for us? Okay, so I'm going (laughs) to chill us all out and say I am just about over the extreme proliferation of the obsession with self-care. Now, yes, (laughs) we're a stressed out nation. We need a little gentleness with ourselves every now and again. But look, I am traveling this week. I don't have cable at home. But when I travel, I do this thing where after I'm done with all my events for the day, I turn on the TV and binge watch Friends until I am sleeping. So I'm in Montana. I'm binge watching Friends. And a laundry detergent commercial comes on where they are trying to convince me that laundry soap can be an important part of my self-care regimen? No, 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 no. You just need to chill out, people. This has gone too far. I will scrub my face with the latest goop that's going to make me look 20 years younger. But don't try to sell me that doing the laundry is part of self-care. I'm over it. Not everything is like some kind of self-actualization project. Wow, Michelle, it sounds like self-care is stressing you out. Um, (laughs) Also, self-care can be an abdication of responsibility. Self-care can be, (laughs) God, I can't believe I'm saying this right. (laughs) There's things that you need to engage with in life. And self-care, I think, sometimes can morph into denialism. You know, I'm not going to pay attention to X, Y, or Z. Why? Because it's self-care. Be an engaged citizen. Maybe that's what this is. Maybe they're concerned that I'm spending so much time on self-care that I'm letting my poor family's laundry just sit in a stinky pile. And this is the answer to that. Ross, what's your self-care regimen? My self-care is podcasting. Oh, <laughs> Ross. No, I think to Carlos's point, 
there's, yeah, there's a, a sort of toxic dynamic where people stress themselves out by being on the internet and sort of experiencing, you know, the terrors of the world virtually. And then that makes them decide they need to go do self-care. And what gets neglected is the zone in between of your sort of normal relationships and obligations that have nothing to do with politics, but also aren't about, you know, scented candles. I don't think I have that that problem. Um, my everyday life presents, you know, plenty of opportunities to fulfill <laughs> domestic no obligations. Joy? And so, you know, for me not having those obligations and getting to come on this podcast and argue argue pungently with Michelle. That's all the self-care I need. All right. Well, on that note, dear listeners, please go take care of yourselves by listening <laughs> No, take, listening no, to more take, episodes of Matter of Opinion. Take care of your obligations. Thank yes. you. There you but go. not doing the laundry. No. This is no. All right. I'll see you next week, guys. See you next week. Bye, guys. Thanks, as always, for joining our conversation. Give Matter of Opinion a follow on your favorite podcast app. And leave us a nice review while you're there to let other folks know why they should listen as we get closer and closer to Election Day. And now that we're about a month away, we want to answer any lingering political questions you may have in an upcoming episode. So let us know what do you want us to talk about before November 5th. Share it with us in a voicemail by calling 212-556-7440. You can also email us at matteropinion at nytimes.com. Matter of Opinion is produced by Sofia Alvarez Boyd, Phoebe Lett, and Andrea Betanzos. This episode was edited by Jordana Hochman and Phoebe Lett. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Carol Sabaro, Sonia Herrero, Amin Sahota, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Pat McCusker and Sonia Herrero. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. <laughs>